Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We Let's get started. Um, it sounds like most of you already know George Olson <laughs> that are on here. Um, but he, of course, has a show at Dot Dotson's right now and um, is going to show us some more of his work and talk about his career. Um, so, George, if you want to just go ahead and take over. <laughs> okay, uh, I am going to talk uh, a little bit here. Um, and go through a little bit of my background and things like that, but uh, let's wait until the end of the show and I'll take questions and whatever, rather than, rather than trying to uh, stop and talk in the middle of it. So, um, George, can you make your screen full? You're just one of the uh, eight that's on here. You, you have that choice. I There's do. There's 12 oh. so far. You, you have the oh. choice in the upper right corner where it says view. You oh. can click on speaker or you can click on the gallery of everybody. Oh, okay. Thanks. Now, uh, Guy, I'm not seeing anybody on the... You, you said I would see the participants over on the side. Oh, there they are. Yeah, you, you're not on Zoom then. <laughs> okay, so... Are you seeing my screen? Not yet, no. Now oh, we are. Yeah, yeah. Yep. got okay. it. There we go. Okay, so we'll we'll uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, and then we'll start in with the images, and and we'll go through that. And then at the end, if you have any questions or uh, <laughs> far away. So uh, like a lot of photographers and particularly photojournalists, I got hooked on photography shooting for the high school newspaper and yearbook. Um, I was, as you could probably guess, I was kind of nerdy back then and uh, took me a while to finally realize that the reason the cheerleaders liked me was just because I put their pictures in the newspaper and the yearbook. Um, but it was, it was kind of cool because it was an early experience of having all kinds of, of, uh, assignments and, and everything from, uh, you know, classes to sports, to events and, and, uh, getting behind the scenes, which was access, which was really a cool thing for photographers. As most of, you know, I remember putting a Dymo label on the back of my first 35 millimeter camera that said, move in closer. Um, I think to overcome my shyness, but I also found that filling the frame made better pictures. Um, so as a kid, I had a lot of different hobbies and I would cycle through these hobbies and try this and try that and get tired of this and move on to something else. And so when I told my, when I told my parents that I needed a Leica to be a photographer, they were of course skeptical of that. So <laughs> they said, well, you know, we'll pay for half of it. So of course I had to pitch in and find lawn mowing jobs and all kinds of stuff. But um, I really immersed myself into, into photography. And of course, one of the benefits of growing up in Topeka, Kansas was that the daily newspaper was, was really a daily lesson in photography because at that time, the Topeka paper with the director of photography, Rich Clarkson was one of the best one of the two or three best in the nation at uh, using photography in a daily newspaper. Um, we had, uh, one of the things that Rich Clarkson did was at the, as the, at the newspaper office, once a month, he would host the local high school photographers and have one of his staff photographers make some kind of a presentation. So we learned a lot from the real pros and, um, you know, at, that was when I first had this dream of, of working for that paper um, and being a newspaper photographer, a photojournalist. So anyway, I eventually saved a lot of money and uh, I, I remember saving $25 off the price of the Leica because I got the model without the self timer. That was an additional $25. And those are rare cameras today, <laughs> but uh, Anyway, then I started with a collapsible used 50 millimeter lens 
but as soon as I could, I got a 35 and that became my standard lens. And I don't think I ever used a 50 again. So um, my dad made a dark room in the basement. And that was, that was really fun because that was part of the magic, of course, of being able to do photography at home as well as in the high school dark room. And uh, I'm sure you all remember the first time you tried to load a roll of film in the dark. Um, it was, uh, it, it took a little bit of practice and some, sometimes you had to start in the daylight with your eyes closed. So anyway, of course, this was all back in the days of, of uh, non-automatic anything, no autofocus, no auto exposure, no nothing. So this was my first page one picture. And this, this was a picture taken with my phone uh, at a high school reunion when somebody brought the Topeka High School world. And I realized that there was my first page one picture. My second shot of my page one picture with the iPhone is not very good, but anyway, you get the idea. And it's uh, interesting that it involves signs. So there we are. So my, my plan for my photographic career was to go to college in Topeka for a couple of years and then transfer to Missouri University, get a degree in photojournalism, and then come back and beg Rich Clarkson for a job. In the meantime, I continued to shoot for the university or, uh, yearbook and newspaper. And as luck would have it, uh, I got a call at the student union newspaper office from Rich Clarkson's chief photographer, Perry Riddle, asking me if I'd like to come to work on Saturdays. So here I was a sophomore at Washburn, nowhere near transferring to Missouri University, and I got a job one day a week. And then the summer intern got drafted, so he joined the Navy, Hal Stelsley, for any of you who know him. And uh, so I got the summer intern job. And at the end of the summer, I got hired full time and stayed there eight years. So there were a lot of influences on my life, a lot of whom were at that very paper, the Topeka Capital Journal. David Allen Harvey went on to National Geographic and then Magnum. Brian Lanker won a Pulitzer Prize in Topeka on a, on a, uh, a story on natural childbirth, which back in 1973 was a pretty revolutionary thing to have pictures of in a daily newspaper. Uh, Mark Godfrey went to Magnum. Jim Richardson is still shooting for National Geographic. Chris Johns went from photographer to editor-in-chief of National Geographic. And Carl DeVos went to, um, from Topeka to Missoula and to Eugene and to our screen today. <laughs> so the competition was intense and you know I was never the best there but I got better and I expanded I expanded beyond the Leica. So <clears throat> the newspaper in Topeka was a combination of, of news events and of course Kansas tornadoes. This was uh, the city commission who was totally against the mayor wouldn't vote for anything he wanted wouldn't even sit for a quorum of the meeting. So at five minutes after nine, they got up and left. And uh, and here's a picture that I really like of the, uh, the breadth of baseball fandom. This is Catfish Hunter. Then feature pictures. This was in my neighborhood in Potwin. Uh, nice brick street added to the atmosphere of the little witch and the, and the little kids and the dog. Whoops. This is Bill Evans, jazz pianist. Feature pictures. I call this the long and short of it. That's me in the background doing a Hail Mary at the back of Bobby Kennedy's head. This is Alf Landon, a famous native son of Topeka, landslide loser in the 1936 election, uh, former governor of Kansas at the 1972 Republican convention in Miami Beach. Um, then I moved to the uh, Kansas City Star and, uh, free, and 
decided it was time to move along. Uh, there's that Leica again. I went to Kansas City as the sports photographer. And of course, in Topeka, I had experience shooting everything. And because Rich Clarkson was a was a stringer or freelancer for or contract photographer for Sports Illustrated, it was expected that we would all be really good sports photographers. So this is a picture of George Brett breaking up a double play at second base. But I really wasn't a big sports fan at all. So I started looking for elements of humor or surprise in sports. Went to a high school game, bad light, low light, but there was a giant puddle at one end of the field. So I just stayed there and I waited the whole game for this shot, <laughs> but it was pretty much the storyteller of the game. This was a young weightlifter struggling. This is short and tall. Here's Hank Stram, the, uh, the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, who always had to be just perfect with his tie tightened up and his toupee firmly in place. <laughs> Here he is with John Matuzak. And here's Bobby, the uh, equipment manager, fitting a helmet on another giant guy. That is Joe DiMaggio. So, in Kansas City, I, I wangled an assignment to go out to California and photograph the, I don't remember if it was the Chiefs or the Royals on some kind of a road trip. And so I said I was going to be in San Francisco. And I said, is there anything else you want? And Fritz Chrysler, who was the sports editor, said, well, why don't you get me an updated picture of Joe DiMaggio? And he kind of chuckled. And I thought, okay, let's see if we can do that. So I spent a lot of time chasing telephone leads and of course, this was in the days of, you know, long distance calls and no cell phones and everything. And I called the restaurant and I called his sister and I called all kinds of people. And I finally got a hold of Joe and he said, I'm going to be in the United Airlines lounge before I catch a flight at such and such a, a time. And so this, of course, looks like Joe's living room, but it was the United lounge. And I go back and lay it on the desk for Fritz Chrysler. And I said, there you go. There's Joe DiMaggio for you. So I, I, I considered that a little bit of a triumph. But there were other things that I kind of explored in Kansas City beyond sports. And I found a gallery in Kansas City with an exhibit of sculpture. Now, you might think that the guy on the right is a Dwayne Hansen sculpture, but you'd be wrong. The sculpture is in the chair. The guy is the truck driver who came to take the exhibit away and I said, now, of course, I, I realize this is setting up a picture, which you're not supposed to do. But I said, I'm not quite ready. Why don't you just sit down and check over your paperwork? So then I backed off and got this picture. So <clears throat> after being in Kansas City for a few years and not being a sports fan, I moved on to Kansas City, where I worked for the San Francisco Examiner. And this is what a real newsroom looked like in the late 70s and early 80s. The object that's directly in the foreground is an ingenious device that is a keyboard connected directly to a printer. <laughs> so I lived in San Francisco on Potrero Hill and uh, tried to find some, some other interesting pictures beyond just newspaper pictures, but uh, you know, I call this one peace. This is in Coney Island. This is, uh, I don't know what this was, some kind of a costume affair of some sort. I carried my Leica everywhere I went. This was a Thanksgiving dinner at some friend's house. And this woman said, I've eaten so much, I've had to unbutton my pants. And the woman on the left, who was the hostess of the Thanksgiving said, I hope your pants don't fall down when you stand up. And she said, let's see. And this was my picture. 
<laughs> so then even in travels, I look for kind of storytelling things, the, the layers of information to be found in one frame. This is Parc Monceau in Paris in the 18th arrondissement. And I just like the, the way there's a little bit of action in each segment of the frame. This is the Louvre framed by the clock in the tower of the Musée d'Orsay, a former train station. This was New Year's Eve in a small town in France that I used to visit regularly. This is in Italy in 2013. I was helping edit a workshop with Catherine Carnot. This is Petigliano. And actually, this is the only digital image in this whole show. Because that's obviously not a Leica with a 35. And this, I was with my son in line at the Broad Museum in LA, standing behind this guy with a JFK shirt. And then once we were inside the museum, lo and behold, here's Andy Warhol's uh, uh, painting or image of Jackie. So of course I staked this out and got this, and this is the only cropped image in the show. So there we have it. So <clears throat> anyway, from there I went to work at Sunset. I was the picture editor there for 10 years. And I just wasn't carrying my camera every day. So um, meanwhile, I, I did have, during the time that I was freelancing, 20 years in San Francisco, I had the opportunity to travel for Sports Illustrated a little bit for a couple of National Geographic book projects. And along the way, shooting everything in color with a broad range of Nikon cameras and lenses and equipment and remote controls and all the kind of stuff that people did then and do now. I still, I shot, I carried my Leica and looked for um, interesting things along the way. I called them roadside distractions. And when I was a kid, my dad had a drawer full of maps and I'd pull one out and spread it on the floor and imagine going to all the little towns with funny names and uh, the roads that became that came to be called Blue Highways. So years later, when I was preparing for one of those geographic stories, I did the same thing and found America City on a map. That seemed a little too good to be true. And in fact, it wasn't there when I tried to drive to it. I found out later during a visit to National Geographic that the cartographers put a signature imaginary town on their maps so they can tell if somebody steals their map. So, <clears throat> Anyway, I had a lot of different influences. Walker Evans, David Plowden, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Elliot Irwood, of course. So I'm a bit of a collector. So I began collecting these signs that I thought were interesting. I think a lot of them are surprising. They're straightforward, but they don't necessarily answer everything that something's unanswered, which to me kind of leave something for the viewer to figure out. So here we go. This is on Route 66. <laughs> Frisco, Texas. I was on the way to a Formula One race in Dallas. Thanks to the Missouri workshop, I visited Peculiar, Missouri. This is in Indiana on the way back from the Indianapolis 500. Another one, either going to or from the Indy 500. I would fly into Kansas City and then drive to Indianapolis with a friend. So that explains the road trips. This was the annual meeting of uh, AT&T. And uh, I always thought, welcome America, but only if you're a ticket holder. <laughs> this is uh, the center 
Geodetic Center of the United States. Lecompton, Kansas, or no, Lecompton, something else. I was taking, driving my son from Topeka to Boston University to enroll in college, and we went through Canada for part of, from Detroit to Niagara Falls. In 1981, I, my son and I drove from Topeka to San Francisco in a rather roundabout way. This was in South Dakota, and uh, it took us, I don't know, almost two weeks, I think. You may remember the Pinto that was, that had a, a poorly placed gas tank and would explode in a rear end collision. an actual town in Iowa. Another visit to Missouri, thanks to the Missouri Photo Workshop. Another picture from Canada. I used this one year on a holiday card. I guess at some newspapers, this would be called a weather picture. This was thanks to an assignment to uh, the San Francisco Giants spring training in Casa Grande, Arizona. So I was doing some research when I was scanning a bunch of negatives for a possible book project. And of course I couldn't remember where I shot this. So just on the off chance, I Googled it. This is now a huge construction company in Kansas run by Larry and Leroy. It's a giant construction company. So this was, this was their start.
This was in Long Beach during the Long Beach Grand Prix. <clears throat> Everyone that works for Dick Tracy Enterprises could now wear an eye, an eye watch and talk to their wrist. Everything in the picture is coin operated. This is the great meteor crater in Arizona. Thanks, Cooper. So sometimes people ask me if I'm ever outside the United States, do I still find anything funny? This is in Wales.
So there we have it. Bravo. Very nice, George. Thank you. Any questions or anything? Is this last seems shot? Like in, is this the last shot in Wales uh, digital? Yes. That's in Wales. Yeah. Is it digital? No, that's that's Leica. Oh, okay. Really good. Sharp. <clears throat> really funny, George. Really great signs. I, I, do you still see them? Do you still find signs like that? Uh, that's interesting because my son said the same thing. It's like the same thing that, that photographers hear all the time. So what are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, um, I actually started going out and purposely you know, driving on some back roads and stuff like that. And what I, the main thing I found out doing that, even though I found some images, I found out that my Leica needed repair. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to send the Leica off for repair and then go out and try and reshoot some of those things. And they aren't in this show, but I do, I do have some, some new images that I think are kind of fun. Thanks to Cooper. Cool. Hey, George, when you were working at these newspapers from Topeka and uh, Kansas City, did the photog staff photographers develop and the, the, the frame and do the prints, or was there a lab technician that did that? No, we had, uh, that's a good question, because that's something I forgot to mention, was that uh, in Topeka, not only did we process our own film and make our own prints, but we made them to column dimensions. So if you wanted to make a, uh, a six column picture, you used 16 by 20 paper that the newspaper supplied. And, um, and of course you could use that as a subtle, you know, you'd take this print out to the desk and you'd say, here's this great shot of such and such. And I think this would make a great four column picture. And it was already printed four column. <laughs> so it was kind of a subtle encouragement to, to run it the size you, you printed it. But the other thing about Topeka was uh, we had, I think, four different picture pages every week. We had a Saturday picture page. We had a Sunday picture page. We had a Sunday magazine that was on newsprint paper. Then we had a Monday sports wrap-up picture page. And so these, these pages that we would do on feature stories, we would draw the layouts we would write the headlines, we would write the captions, and the headlines we would set with that rub off press type back in those days. Mm -hmm. And the, the capital, the morning paper was sans serif and the afternoon paper, the journal was serif type, but you could use <laughs> any serif type or any sans serif type to you know, fit the, the kind of theme of your, of your picture story. So we would do these layouts. So we learned typography, we learned design, we learned, um, you know, storytelling, sequencing, uh, a scene setter, a beginning, a middle, an end, a detail shot, all that kind of stuff that would comprise a picture page. And these, of course, were in the days when newspapers were bigger than they are now. So <laughs> it was it was really great. And I mean, we had state-of-the-art facilities, state-of-the-art film facilities. R Rich Clarkson based his darkroom in Topeka on Life Magazine in New York. And we had lights enlargers, we had stainless steel sinks, we had, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Cool. Uh, the Kansas City Star hadn't yet moved into the, the latter part of the 20th century. <laughs> And uh, we had four by five enlargers for 35 millimeter film. And uh, they, had a, they had a darkroom guy in Kansas City, but, not, but we weren't required to use that guy. So many of us didn't. Gotcha. Well, just reviewing all these photos of these signs and everything, doesn't it make you want to just hit the road? Yeah, of course it does. Road trip. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I know you're a big proponent of road trips and you've in, even been to Kansas on a couple of your road trips. That's true, that's true. Yeah, I've, 
I, uh, I owe a great deal to being on the faculty of the Missouri Book Workshop for 10 or 12 years. Every year they go to a different small town in Missouri. And um, so while the students were out shooting, I got to do some of the same things. And I really discovered a lot of back roads in Missouri as well as, as well as having like three different National Geographic book assignments in Kansas. So I remember one time driving 3000 miles within the state of Kansas, which is 400 by 200 miles. <laughs> That was, that was a lot of fun. Cool. Was this presentation recorded and perhaps available to show other people? Yes. yes. Go ahead, it will be on the Photography and Oregon website, you know, in a, in a day or two. The which site? Photography at Oregon. Okay. Dot, dot org. That's that's the whole website, photographyinoregon.org. Photography at Oregon. .org. At Oregon. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I belong to a camera club. I, I'm sure all my, my co-fellow members would love to see this. There's yeah. about 50, 50 of them. Well, it was hard not to ask questions as you went along because most of the questions were, how could that exist? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And that's, you know, that's part of the that's part of the fascination for me, like who could possibly name their company adequate roofing? I mean, what were they thinking? You know, obviously not thinking or blixed construction. Where did they come up with that? Well, there's also yeah. an awful brothers gas company. It's a whole series of gas stations called awful brothers, but yeah. Yeah. Rotten Robbie and stuff like that. Some of those are so obvious to me, a play on, just getting attention that I sort of bypassed Rotten Robbie and and some of the things like that. So adequate roofing would be first in the phone book. That's a trick that nobody knows anymore. But well, I guess that's true. Yeah, that, that might have had who knows? Who knows? David Zeitz posted a picture of a phone book that somebody threw in his in his driveway. Um, and on the cover of the phone book, it said uh oh david what did it say now i can't remember hang on let me uh... the original search engine i got one no, that was it the original <laughs> search engine right <laughs> and i thought well still trying to hang on <laughs> i'd hate to be an ad salesperson for the yellow pages yeah. <laughs> yeah i liked your description of the uh, typewriter oh yeah <laughs> you remember terrible herbst gas stations yes yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's still some out there, but you know what's happening is that communities have sign regulations now, and there's so many chain stores that it's put a lot of uh, mom and pop businesses out of business. So a lot of my a lot of my territory has been subsumed by growing cities and sign regulations and things like that. But I think what's left is kind of a commentary on, you know, social. Uh, sort of a vanishing part of Americana. Maybe. Yeah. Right. For sure. So Carl DeVos and I are working on a book of these images right now. And uh, once we get a little further down the line, then the next step will be trying to find a publisher. And I'm sure all of you know how difficult that can be. So um don't hold your breath <laughs> <laughs> keep hoping but don't hold your breath we're 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 trying i'll come to the book party for sure all right great he doesn't care if you come to the party he wants you to buy a book <laughs> oh well, well, george that was really or... really fun really great thanks city yeah Guy, thank you very much for hosting and for getting us over the initial uh, hurdle of, of signing into all this. I appreciate your help. Sure. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your images and stories with us, and we'll let everybody go about their day then. Okay, so uh, once, the, uh, once the 
recording is up on your site, I'll I'll get a link to that and uh, put that up on Facebook. Sounds good.